Hello, everyone. Very glad you are all able to join us here in Rayburn House Office Building. I'm Nate Kazmarek. I direct the Article One Initiative for the Federal Society. I'm pleased to welcome you all to part one of our two-part series on states as laboratories of democracy. We're very happy to be co-sponsoring today's discussion with the Constitutional Sources, Sources Project. Uh, the project is dedicated to increasing knowledge of the history of our Constitution, and they are doing a lot of interesting work. Uh, along with uh, the Quill Project at Oxford University, they are currently working on multi a multi-year project to digitize, transcribe, and make freely available a searchable online digital collection of 2.5 million pages of historical materials related to early state constitutional development. In, sep in, se in September 2019, Consource, along with partners at Oxford University in the UK, will be launching the US State Constitutions Network, a network aimed at bringing together projects and individuals interested in studying US state constitutions. To learn more uh, about all of their great work, please visit consource.org. Hamilton and Madison wrote in Federalist uh, 20 that experience is the oracle of truth. And where, and where its responses are unequivocal, they ought to be conclusive and sacred. And so it's appropriate to spend some time this afternoon looking into the founders' history and experience and to examine the early state governments and their influence in the framing of the legislative branch. To help us with this task, we are grateful to have uh, gathered with us an insightful moderator and panel. Um, our moderator today is Julie Silverbrook, who is the executive director at Consource. Prior to this role, she founded and directed Constitutional Conversations, an award-winning constitutional literacy program. Ms. Silverbrook holds a JD from William & Mary Law School and a BA in political science from George Washington University. Before I turn it over to her, a note for our audience that, as always, the panel is happy to take your questions during Q&A. So please think of the difficult questions you'd like to ask of them. With that, Julie, the floor is yours. I did not know that I was doing uh, intros for the panelists. Uh, oh. So uh, I will allow them to uh, introduce themselves. And we're going to get started with Mark. OK, very good. Okay. I'm Mark. <laughs> Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm Mark Graber. I teach at the University of Maryland. Francis King Carey, when you give $30 million, you have to say all three names, uh, School of Law. And I'm here to sort of give a little bit of an historical perspective. And it's important from the perspective of history that what we're talking about today is not a set of snapshots, still lives, but a motion picture. People are moving. That is, they've been someplace. They're going someplace. There are forces we don't see in the snapshot moving them. And I want to talk about them a little bit. And to talk about them, I want to start with the subsidy, because if there's one thing I hope you get out of today's talk, it's the extraordinary importance of the subsidy in Anglo-American constitutional development. See, the idea is the way government gets funded is by voluntary donations. We have the king. And we all know the king needs money. Needs money to fight wars with France. Needs money to have castles and has parties. And we have a stake in this. So when the king comes around, you know, we give the king some money to run the government. But there's, but there's a little problem with that. Namely, the king can't go around and just, you know, sort of go, you yeah. know, I've got a good king this year, and he's going to have 15 bucks. Doesn't work that way. So what do we do? And this is actually the origin of representation. We say, OK, you guys. What? Elect a representative. I think she can't. For the video they need you on the mic. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm well, she can carry the mic with you. Okay. We say first three rows, elect a representative. You guys elect a representative. And in Parliament, we will decide how much money we're going to give the king. <laughs> 
So notice that taxation as it starts is not coercive. It is your voluntary donation made through your representatives. And that is what Parliament does. Parliament, for the most part, doesn't pass laws. It's rather remarkable. If you go through English yearbooks, the average state legislature on Monday morning fills up more pages than the English Parliament does in the 15th century in 50 years. The subsidy is what it's about. And over time, the subsidy is used as a governing device. So with the English Civil War, Parliament convenes. And Parliament says, before we give the subsidy, we want to talk about foreign policy. What's going to be your attitude towards France? The king says, none of your business. Vote me the subsidy. Parliament says, we're not going to vote you a subsidy until you tell us what you're going to do with France, what you're going to do about Catholics. But that is the way governing takes place through the subsidy. Now, first thing you notice, now we understand what no taxation without representation means. Because if the tax is your free gift, it can only be made by you or your representatives. Second, we know the major problems in organizing a legislature. One, it should only be taxpayers, since that's what they're doing. Second, it's largely amateurs. They come, they do the subsidy, they have a few parties and try to marry off their daughters and go home. Now, this is to some degree how early American legislatures start. Also, how do we get the revenue? Volunteering. But something begins to happen in the 18th century. Legislatures start governing. They start doing things Parliament never did. They start building roads. They start printing money. They start organizing criminal codes. In the South, they start organizing slave codes. And now, as we do this, a question arises. Is a legislature structured to pay or do the subsidy the right kind of institution to build roads, print money, do all of the things that state legislatures do. And what we start to see, and what John is going to comment at great length, and Lynn as well, is people starting to think constitutionally about what do we do with a state legislature that's actually engaged in legislating, in governing. And there are five things they think about. And one thing, actually, they never do think about. First thing is maybe we have to broaden representation. If, after all, the legislature, in addition to taxing, is going to command all adult men spend three days working on the town roads, then maybe all adult men ought to have some say in the selection of the representatives, and not simply those who pay taxes. The second thing is exhortation. And one of the wonderful things about early state constitutions is there are passages that occur that are not in the US Constitution, or not any modern constitution. And that is, you know, government ought to do good things. Government ought to be free from corruption. Government ought not to violate rights. It doesn't really say, here's a right you can't violate. It says ought. It is exhortation. New Hampshire Constitution, we ought to pass wholesome laws. Second thing we do is we start to have procedural limitations. Bill's got to be read three times. It's got to be announced. Some bills, you can 
have them in one session, there's got to be holdover, a second session. Different procedural rules designed to get better legislation. We start to bring governors and courts back in. The Pennsylvania Constitution was largely a legislative supremacy. It's the first really big constitution, 1776. Future constitutions, the role of the lower house diminishes, upper houses expand. We start to ask ourselves the Madison question. Namely, what are the competences or competencies of a legislature? How can we improve the quality of the people in the legislature? How do we devise an electoral system, not simply to get people to pay the subsidy, but how do we devise an electoral system that gets people who know how to build roads, people who know when you print money and when you don't print money? But there's one interesting thing they don't do. For the most part, they don't say the way we're going to solve the problem of bad legislatures is through limiting them substantively. The early state constitutions don't say, even though this is for the public good, you can't do it. You're limited. The limits are more internal in the structures of procedures. There really is only one major thing Parliament in the 17th century would recognize as a limit on their powers, and it's a very big one. As state constitutions develop, they begin to bring back in executive power, and you start to see little things like the legislature cannot suspend the pay of the executive. So we bring back in legislating, and we also bring in the modern concept of taxation, which is no longer the gift we freely give to government, but the price for living in a civilized society. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I, I do want to... I do want to note that uh, all of our speakers' bios are available on the website. And now we are going to have uh, John Dynan, who's a professor of politics at Wake Forest University. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm so glad to be a part of this panel, to be a part of a panel on state constitutions. We don't spend near as much time talking about and recognizing state constitutions as we do. And so I'm glad to be a part of a panel focusing on that. But I'm also particularly glad to be a part of a panel focusing on state constitutions and in governing institutions. Because usually when we do turn our attention to state constitutions, the focus is on state bills of rights. And people say, oh, let's look at state bills of rights as a precursor to the federal bill of rights. Let's look at right to bear arms clauses or religious liberty clauses and see what light they can shed. Well, that's all interesting, but we don't pay, spend as much time as we do. How did the institutional experimentation that took place in state constitutions, how can we learn from that? So I propose today to take a few minutes just talking about the drafting of state constitutions. Let's just situate ourselves in the 1776 to 1787 era and then talk about three key decisions that state constitution makers had to face when drafting legislators and talk about areas of universal or consensus among the states and issues of variation. In short, what did the delegates to the Federal Convention of 1787 have before them to draw on when they were designing a Congress? Well, let me first start with the drafting of constitutions. So New Hampshire and South Carolina were the first states to draft constitutions in 1776. They were really intended to be temporary documents. They fully expected them to be replaced as soon as the war situation was taken care of. Virginia was next to go, and it was the first that really intended to draft a more permanent or enduring constitution. It was also the first to include a Bill of Rights along with the document. Uh, in the rest of the year, then, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and North Carolina would all draft constitutions. So by the end of 1776, we have eight states that had drafted constitutions that year. Three more states would follow in 1777, Georgia, Vermont, and New York. Uh, Massachusetts, after eventually, if originally having a constitution voted down, eventually approved its constitution in 1780. By 1780, then, we had 11 of the 13 states 
had drawn up constitutions, and then Vermont had joined in as well. So we basically had 12 states that had drafted constitutions. Connecticut and Rhode Island never did revise their colonial charters. They would actually operate under their original charters until the 1800s. So they never did participate in this early wave of actually full-scale constitution drafting. And then one more thing to say about this is, of the three states that did draft constitutions early on, three of them actually came back and wrote new constitutions prior to 1787. South Carolina replaced its temporary document, New Hampshire replaced its temporary document, and Vermont gave a second go. So to sum up here, by the time we get to 1787 at the Federal Convention, we have 15 constitutions institutions that have been drafted in a total of 12 states. Just a word on the process. After all, this is a new enterprise. We're drafting constitutions. How do we go about doing this in that way? So two of the earliest efforts in Virginia and South Carolina were drafted by provincial congresses, that basically switched over from the task of, let's, we're governing one day, now let's draw a constitution up, now let's go back to governing. But all the other states eventually said, no, let's actually select and elect special delegates for the express purpose of drafting constitutions. And so that would become the model. And then finally, Massachusetts and New Hampshire would take the final step that we know of. They say, let's not just elect delegates for the express purpose of drafting constitutions. Let's submit their work for popular ratification. That would soon become the norm for writing constitutions, not only at the state level, but at the federal level. So what are these decisions? With that said as context, what are some of the three decisions that had to be made in designing a legislature in particular? So let me focus on three. One decision, how tightly to connect legislators to the general public. Second decision, should we have a Senate? And if so, what should it be its nature? And a third set of questions, what should be the powers and what should be the constraints on the legislature? Let me take each of those up briefly. First question, uh, what's the relation of legislators to citizens? Here, the key hallmarks were responsive governance, representatives as a mirror of the citizenry. That is, representatives were to be on a tight, tight leash from the citizenry. And that's nowhere more in evidence than the fact of the standard line at this time where annual elections end, tyranny begins. So all but one state, the lower house, annual elections in that way. South Carolina actually deviated and provided for every two years in that sense. But really, annual elections. So that's as constant as it goes. Turns out Connecticut and Rhode Island, you're still, um, they didn't revise their documents. They were reelected every six months in that way in that sense. So tight leash is what we would say. Now, some states went even further in keeping legislators on a tight leash. And let me just mention two of those ways. Four states. Pennsylvania, Vermont, Massachusetts, and North Carolina explicitly put in the Declaration of Rights, the people shall have a right to instruct their representatives. This right of instruction was meant to say, you are bound to public opinion. That was what that was meant to signal. And then a second innovation, I'll close off here, was Pennsylvania provided for legislative term limits in its 1776 Constitution. As I should note, so did the Articles of Confederation provide for limits on the terms that could be served. In Pennsylvania, legislators were permitted to serve no more than four years in any seven-year period. That's for a tight leash in that sense, frequent rotation. How about the second question or set of questions? Should there be a Senate? And if so, what, what, kind, what should the Senate be doing? Three states made the decision, let's not have a Senate. Pennsylvania, Vermont, and Georgia did not initially have a Senate. They were unicameral in their state, initial state constitutions. Now, Pennsylvania and Georgia would quickly add a Senate in 1789 and 1790, respectively. Vermont would stay unicameral until 1836 in that way. All the other states, they said, no, let's have a, let's have a second house. But then the question is, what do we do? What does the second house do? It's not, one thing is just say, well, let's have two houses. Let's provide kind of a check in that sense. But universally, the idea was if we're going to have a second house, it should get a different perspective. We should actually have different perspectives so that you get more deliberation. But how do you get those perspectives? Is it just different institutional design, or are you actually setting up one to body to be a more aristocratic or property protection body? For the most part, the focus was on institutional differences, though with some effort to set up a property protecting or more aristocratic body. Let me run through these here. Um, all states had sent, their Senates had fewer members in the House. 
And the parallel to that was they had much larger districts from which you were generally selecting the members of the Senate. The idea that might get more deliberation and you might even get a higher quality of person selecting from a larger constituency. The majority of states, though not all, senators serve longer terms. So when I talked about the annual elections, that was for the lower house. But for the second house, they were willing to deviate from that. Several states had four-year terms, and Maryland went the farthest. Maryland had five-year Senate terms in that way. Maryland did one other thing that was notable. Maryland selected its senators through an electoral college type of mechanism. Voters of Maryland would go to the polls, and they would vote for electors. The electors would then meet, and the electors would select the Senate members of the 15-member Maryland Senate in that way. In terms of a specific concern for property, there was some, and let me take note of that, the vast majority of states set a higher property requirement for serving in the Senate than in serving in the House. And so they wrote this very detailed, here's what you have to have if you have uh, 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 to be in the Senate. Um, two states, New York and North Carolina, actually imposed higher property requirements for voting in House and Senate elections. So one set of people could vote for House elections, but then you had to have a higher property requirement if you wanted to actually vote for the Senate elections. And then two states, I'll close off here for this second point, New Hampshire and Massachusetts, they actually apportioned their Senate districts, not based on population, not based on township, but based on taxes paid. So depending on what taxes were paid, that's how they would apportion out the, the seats. Turn to the third and final point here. What's, what, what should be the powers of the legislature and what should be the constraints on the legislature? Mark already mentioned this, but if one thing is clear as a universal, specifically from these early state constitutions, state constitutions provided that legislature shall have plenary power, except there are, unless there are an express limitations on that power. And so states would simply say, as Georgia did, Georgia said, quote, the legislature shall have power to make such laws and regulations as may be conducive to the good order and well-being of the state, provided such laws and regulations be not repugnant to the true intent and meaning of any rule or regulation contained in this Constitution. That was par for the course. A few states would actually enumerate a few powers, but then they'll go on and say, and of course they have anything else that they need to do to govern effectively in that sense. So the enumeration was not meant to limit. It was more just to be illustrative to get started. How about, though, constraints on this virtual plenary power that was exercised by state legislatures? Two approaches that were taken. One approach was the approach taken in Pennsylvania. How will you limit or constrain the power of the legislature? It will be through the public. It will be through the election process. It will be through transparency. So Pennsylvania went about this. They said, look, any laws that actually get introduced, they will have to be held over until the next session after an intervening election can take place and presumably the public could vote out of office anybody that was supporting bad bills. So that was the electoral check. The people will be the ones to constrain the legislature through the electoral process. But as time went along, there was an effort to say, could we set up another institutional check of some kind? And here the question is, should there be a veto power that could be placed? Again, two approaches here. New York set up what they called a council of revision. It was a mix of executive and judicial officers who had the power to veto legislation passed by the state legislature, subject to a two-thirds legislative override. But this council of revision, mix of the governor, the chancellor of the highest state court, the members of the second highest court, that was the New York approach, council of revision. The only other state that by 1787 provided for a veto of some kind was Massachusetts, which provided for the governor could veto legislation, could be overridden by two-thirds uh, override. South Carolina, I'll note, had actually passed an absolute veto in 1776 to their governor. I mean, that was really strong in that sense. They took it away two years later when they rewrote their constitution. So in terms of these checks, there's the divide. Let's have a veto check of various kinds. I'll stop here. I know we're having a chance for a lot of discussion and question and answer earlier. My main point is, in short, when the Federal Convention delegates met in 1787, they had a wide range of institutional alternatives before them and experimentation that had taken place. In some ways, there was consensus that they could draw on, and in some cases, repudiate at the federal level. In some cases, there were innovations that they could put on the table and draw from. Next up, we have Lynn Uzell, who is a lecturer at the University of Virginia and the University of Richmond. 
Thank you. And I would like to thank very much the uh, Federalist Society and the Article One initiative. And I am so thrilled that there is an initiative devoted just to Article One. And of course, um, constitutional sources, which I've noticed is showing up in my Google so searches more and more often as I look for particular documents. Um, so I thought that what I would do for my brief 10 minutes is I would try to sort of block out the broad uh, strokes of what the Constitutional Convention did when structuring Article I of the Constitution and how they looked back to their experience with the state constitutions in order to inform them for what they were doing for Article I. And I thought that these broad strokes would look at three categories, uh, the ways that the state legislatures provided a positive model with which the framers decided that they would emulate, uh, instances in which the state legislatures provided a negative example or problems to either be avoided or somehow remedied. And then finally, the third category is instances in which the state legislatures provided no kind of example at all because the federal constitution was doing something completely different from the states. So I'm going to go briefly through um, the first category, not because it's not important, but because for better or for worse, we just take it so much for granted. Uh, that first of all, when forming a legislature, it should be bicameral. Uh, as John already ably uh, described, most of the states decided that it should, uh, that a legislature should be bicameral. And I had only two states as exceptions because I didn't count Vermont because it wasn't a state yet. But uh, Georgia and Pennsylvania were the only states that did not choose to have bicameral legislatures. Uh, but added to that, you might say that their experience was also under the Articles of Confederation, which of course was unicameral. And therefore, the framers of the Constitution had to decide whether to depart from that model. So therefore, what we find is that many of the framers of the Constitution did want to stick with the unicameral legislature, not because they thought it was a good form for government, but because they were still in doubt as to whether what they were forming was going to be a government. And therefore, those who still wanted to stick with a confederal kind of arrangement wanted also to stick with a unicameral legislature. But in addition to that, you did have Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the key framers of the Pennsylvania Constitution, also advocate on behalf of a unicameral legislature. But by and large, those who attended the Constitutional Convention thought that uh, bicameral was the best way to go. And also, that if they were going to have two bodies, that it should also have the character of an upper and a lower chamber. As again, John had elaborated so well, the states had already attempted to do, and the framers of the US Constitution decided that they should follow that example and, in fact, uh, improve upon that model, as I'll get to shortly. And then finally, it was decided that the lower house should be democratically elected. Now, again, uh, you might think that with our uh, English and our state constitution as models, that this would be a no-brainer, except that the Articles of Confederation, again, had provided the model where the unicameral legislature contained members who were representing state legislatures. They were chosen by the states, not the people. And therefore, it was a specific move in the direction to be more like the state legislatures, to have the lower house democratically uh, elected. Therefore, again, some of the framers who wanted the more confederal arrangement wanted, likewise, to continue with the model of having only state legislatures choose the representatives. But in addition to that, there were some members who were rather jaundiced about their experience with democracy. And this was coming especially out of Massachusetts, coming out of some very uh, difficult times through Shays' Rebellion, and thinking that their problem was too much democracy. And also members like Charles Pinckney, who uh, at some moments sounded very Tocquevillian in his celebration of American equality, and at other times saying that he wanted the people to have nothing to do with the choice of representatives. So it wasn't a universally accepted principle. Nonetheless, James Madison asserted that uh, it was a clear principle of free government that one chamber at least must be democratically elected. And most members seem to accept that.
So these are the features which emulated the state constitutions, but there were also examples in which the state constitutions provided negative examples. One of these was ineffect ineffective checks on the legislative branch. And this is, again, something that John has already talked quite a bit about, that uh, According to Madison's words, the legislative branches in most of the states had turned into these impetuous vortexes of power in which all of the power flowed to them. And what this meant was that often the executive branch was not strong enough. And therefore, it was a conscious um, decision on the part of the framers of the Constitution to strengthen the other branches of government. And one of the reasons for this was to improve executive power in and of itself. But another of their reasonings for strengthening the executive branch was to add a more effective check on the legislative branch. Now, I want to add just really briefly that even though it was very clear that they meant to strengthen the other branches of government, make them more independent, and make them more effective checks on the legislative branch. I can find nothing in their arguments to suggest that they wanted to establish three co-equal branches. They did want to strengthen the executive branch, but they still, in all their arguments, seem to suggest that the legislative branch was going to continue to be the most powerful, and again, because it was the only branch that was strictly Republican or Democratic or representative. Um, and then secondly, the problem was that the legislative branch had become not only a danger to the other branches of government, but also a danger to the liberties of the people. And additional checks on this would be, first of all, splitting it into two chambers. Uh, but also, this was Madison's famous argument for the ex extended sphere of Republican government. By breaking up fra factions into diverse interests over a large territory, as the United States was, he thought it was less likely that factions would form into a majority. Now, you could say that this is um, simply just built into the system. If you're going to have a legislature that represents the United States of America, it is by definition going to represent a greater number of interests than state legislatures. But what's interesting about Madison's argument, which does not seem to have been very influential at the time, but has become more influential over time, is that he foresaw the way in which Congress would act as an internal check on its, um, on its decisions. And then finally, in my brief few minutes left, I'm going to name three instances in which the federal Congress is not like state legislatures at all. In the first place, uh, is the question of the federative powers. The federative powers are those powers over um, foreign affairs, the treaty-making power, the power to uh, appoint ambassadors, the power to make, uh, declare, and, and uh, make war. Now, these powers were never in the state constitutions. They were always delegated to the federal uh, government. But the interesting thing under the Articles of Confederation was that they were not situated in the executive branch, as they always had been in Europe in that example. But there wasn't there not being an executive branch, they were all housed in Congress. Now, two years before the Constitutional Convention, Madison said that all of the powers, all the great executive powers, are in the federal government, meaning the federal Congress. But during the Constitutional Convention, it was a chance to re-examine that question afresh, whether or not the powers over international relations really were executive in nature, or whether they partook of a legislative function. Therefore, the re-examination of executive power and what it meant, especially vis-a-vis -vis foreign powers, was a reconsideration of the powers belonging and inherent in Congress as well. And as we know, some of these federative powers, the treaty-making power, uh, was divided between the Senate and the President, and the power to declare war was housed strictly in Congress. Um, second, the uh, legislature would possess some 
federal as opposed to federative powers, which is just um, to say that the federal Congress had a certain kind of relationship to the state governments, which is separate from what a state legislature would have to the federal government. So there's just a, a different relation between federal Congress and, um, and state legislature. And then finally, the idea that the federal Congress would be limited in power, not just by the checks that John mentioned, which is to say by the executive veto, or by state, um, or by a bill of rights, which named exceptions to the power that Congress would enjoy. But the framers pretty universally, not totally universally, but pretty universally, had decided that they wanted a Congress with enumerated lim limited powers and that this was a way of dividing um, the powers that would be exercised by the federal Congress from the powers, the plenary powers, the otherwise plenary powers, that would be exercised by the state legislature. So this made it different in kind from uh, a state legislature. And therefore, uh, the framers of the Constitution were both borrowing from their examples in uh, state constitutions, but also innovating in new ways because of the different kind of constitution they were framing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lynn. So I have a, a bunch of follow-up questions uh, for, for all of you. And it, it may seem obvious, but I think it's uh, in, interesting and important context to understand both the practical political reasons for why state constitutions end up creating uh, very strong state legislatures, but also the political philosophy behind the decision to do that. Um, and I'll start with Mark, uh, and then we can just kind of go uh, in order. Well, we, we start with a strong legislature because initially, the problem of governance as perceived by people in the American colonies is the problem of the subsidy. It means we want, as in Parliament, power to be in the legislature, power to be in the body with the people. And since we trust legislatures because they are elected and we don't trust monarchs, that's where we put the power. What happens over the course of the 18th century is we discover just as the human being, the king, is flawed, so lots of human beings in the legislature are flawed. And we begin to think about, and I emphasize begin to think about. This is not a snapshot that in 1783 all Americans stood up and said, yep, we got it, the solution. We begin to think about, well, Given the legislature is doing a lot more than the subsidy, how can they do it well? How can they do it better? How can the Georgia legislature be structured so we will only act in the common good, as the Constitution says? And so we begin to think about alternatives to simply a single body powerful legislature of the Pennsylvania variety. So just to add a little bit of development, it's not simply constitutions get a little more sophisticated, and John, you can disagree, but I think the Pennsylvania Constitution is where England was going. It is supremacy of the lower house of the legislature. As state constitutions evolve, you see more power drifting away from the lower house to the upper house, to the governor, to the courts. Let me pick up on that and, and, and add this point in here. And so it was, it's no doubt the case, as Mark said, and, and as we've said, that the legislature was dominant, especially in these early state constitutions. And yet all of the state constitutions, for the most part, had these very explicit separation of powers clauses of the kind that's really lacking, actually, in the federal constitution that is explicit, you know, the power shall be distinct in that way. And so it's in some ways a paradox. Well, why, why did they give this kind of dominance to the legislature, but then they have this separation 
separation of powers clauses, sometimes where the governor doesn't really have much to do at all. What do they mean by that? And so we have to recover their way of thinking. What did they mean by separation of powers at that time? And what were they drawing on from the English experience? Their key understanding was powers have to be separated so that the executive does not corrupt the legislature by when the executive needs something, uh, giving a job to someone in the legislature and pulling that person into the executive branch somehow or exercising some other corruption. So when they uh, believed in separation of powers and they stated this very forthrightly, that has to be understood in the context of, and what we mean by separation of powers is, if someone gives up his spot in the legislature um, and for another uh, executive position, you have to give up your position in the legislature. You can't be holding multiple positions. Uh, New Jersey's constitution is actually quite explicit about the corruption rationale for separation of powers. They said, therefore, into the end of not allowing corruption, um, nobody can hold offices in multiple uh, branches in that way. Eventually, by the time we get to 1787, separation of powers comes to mean something in addition to that um, that doesn't that doesn't get left behind at all, but it becomes amplified. So I'll just put that piece into things. Yes, clearly the legislature is powerful. And the main thing is we have to protect the legislature from executive uh, corruption of the kind that we've seen elsewhere. Uh, Julie had asked, so, um, so what is the political philosophy behind this thinking? And one of the things that I found very interesting from reading the documents leading up to 1787's convention and in the convention itself is how many people were saying, you know, when we were first developing our constitutions, we had too optimistic a view of human nature. <laughs> that essentially we thought all we had to do was do away with a king and do away with an aristocracy and the virtue of the people would flourish. And so all we needed was to make it more democratic and everything would go sweetly. Um, and then they had the experience of, of what actually took place. And what, what, what took place was two different problems. One of them was, um, was the problem that states were meant just by their own goodwill to follow the regulations, the laws of the, uh, of the Congress under the Articles, because there was no coercive power to make them do so. And so one of the ways in which they had to realize that human nature is not that good is that often they won't comply with law unless they're coerced. And then the other way is, um, for similar reasons, is that they realized that uh, even under popular government, you can have a form of tyranny. So Madison was realizing more and more that, uh, that what, would, what they had been instituting within the state governments were these kind of parchment barriers, these scoldings about how the legislature should not do this or that, which they would openly flout. And therefore, if you wanted to prevent uh, what was the true cause of tyranny, which was not that the legislature would violate the will of the people, but rather that the legislature would follow the will of the people and that the will of the people would be corrupt, and violate rights, then the way to do that is to institute checks. And the reason is not because he thought that there was some other body that was more virtuous than the people. It's that he didn't think that anybody was virtuous. And therefore, you had to organize a government around that presupposition. Thank you for that, Lynn. That's uh, exactly what I was hoping you would say, actually. <laughs> uh, People like John Adams in this period uh, remarked that uh, this is a this was a time in which the lawgivers of antiquity would have loved to live. Right, this is an opportunity for people to choose the form of government that they want to live under, and what a unique moment in history that was. Made even more unique by the fact that most of these colonies turned states are actually writing constitutions during the Revolutionary War. Uh, you have the New York legislature is actually on the run uh, while they're drafting uh, their state uh, constitutions. And yet there is this incredible interstate borrowing of constitutional innovation. And one of the calls of this panel is to explore the idea of states as laboratories of democracy. Uh, and that truly is happening uh, in a really extraordinary time period uh, during the revolutionary constitution writing uh, episodes. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the interstate borrowing that occurs, how those exchanges are happening. And John, I'm going to start with you uh, to answer this question. And what's interesting here is that there's definitely is a lot of this borrowing. Sometimes 
what gets sent out to other states and, and colonies at the time was, is here's our first draft, actually, of what we're going to do. And this is most famously the case. I, I said we often talk about Bill of Rights, and I'll return to a discussion of Bill of Rights. The Virginia Bill of Rights, which is really the first Bill of Rights drafted and actually did have an influence, it turns out that what had the influence was an early draft, actually, of the Virginia Bill of Rights that got circulated elsewhere and then actually kind of went out there. And so there was this hunger for not, don't, not only just give us your finished product, but actually let us see your work in, in product product and actually benefit from that. Um, I mean, I, 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 I would say that that borrowing took place in, that in, in, in various ways. One, which I already mentioned, was just in the very process of drafting a constitution. They had to be figuring out, what are we doing here? Um, I already mentioned the evolution of that. Should it, should it be a body that's separated from the governing body? Eventually say yes. Um, should it be, um, did, can we just proclaim this in effect, or do we have to submit it for popular ratification? I should note that um, Massachusetts and New Hampshire actually required ratification, not just by a majority of the public, actually, but by two thirds of the, of the public in that way. So they set a, set a high barrier. Part of the difficulty why the Massachusetts, their original chef, the public rejected the, the, the first one that got sent out. So they came back and, and reconvened and kind of sent it back. And this time it seems most likely to have gotten the two thirds. In any case, it was determined to have gotten the two thirds necessary. But then um, one other thing I'll mention here is how should we keep a constitution up to date was a question. About half of the states didn't actually provide for any amendment mechanism. They were so much kind of just starting off that they, they just wrote it, and then they said, um, well, um, well I, I, they didn't necessarily even think of what they would, they would be done. But about half of the other states said, no, let's actually give this some thought. How should we revise this if necessary? So Pennsylvania and Vermont, and we say those all to, all together oftentimes because Vermont basically borrowed almost the entirety of Pennsylvania's constitution. Basically, it was Pennsylvania's constitution got set up to Vermont. And then, um, so there's very little daylight between Pennsylvania and Vermont. And so almost any time you say Pennsylvania yeah, and Vermont in that way, they set up something called a council of censors. You heard me talk about the Council of Revision that would be responsible for vetoing legislation. Well, this is a different council. This is a council of censors that every seven years, it would come into being and they say, so how's this government doing? And are there any flaws that need to be fixed? And are there any changes to be made in the Constitution? And if so, let's submit this. And so Vermont's Council of, of Censors actually met on an every seven year basis for basically the better part of the next century. Pennsylvania's only met a few times because Pennsylvania actually then kind of replaced its 1776 Constitution in 1790. And then one final thing I'll mention here. And then the question was Massachusetts put and they said, well, I wonder, should we provide, Jefferson said, um, you know, every generation should get a chance to take a look at its constitution. And in his view, every generation lasts about 19 or 20 years. So Massachusetts provides in their 1780 constitution, 15 years from now, in 1795, a vote shall be held. Do you want to call another convention and revise this? Let's actually put that in place automatically. Um, New Hampshire put in something eventually. No, there will be a convention called in that sense, in that way. F today, 14 states still have a provision that says every 20 years, in some cases every 10 years, that people shall have a chance to vote on whether or not they call a constitutional convention in their state. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I focus here on some of the borrowing that's taking place and what are we doing when we're drafting a constitution? How do we keep it up? Of course, there's a lot of borrowing in the substance as well. <laughs> Well, I want to elaborate on an example that John already gave, which was uh, Massachusetts' decision to frame its constitution um, by a separate body and then ratify it popularly. And, um, and the reason why is because what I would like to emphasize is the way that some of these developments occurred almost accidentally, and then after they occurred, then these brilliant minds set to work to justifying and explaining why it was so superior. So Massachusetts, you know, has has a body that you know frames its constitution and sends it out to um, to some uh, delegates to uh, to ratify it, and it and it doesn't pass. And then the people want to, you know, have the say as to uh, as to you know how it should be framed, and then it was popularly ratified, and Madison who had been on the committee that framed Virginia's constitution and has put, you know, had a little bit of influence in that. And that constitution was ratified by the state legislature and had no more authority than that, the same kind of authority as any ordinary legislation. 
nonetheless look to Massachusetts' example as the way that constitutions ought to be framed. And therefore, when he was writing his vices of the political system of the United States, when he was talking about the vices of the articles, one of his main vices is that they had not had a good ratification process. And he looked to the example of Massachusetts and gave all of these reasons based in, um, in popular sovereignty, based in uh, rule of law, based in constitutional interpretation, as to why that was a superior method of ratification. And that's why any future constitution they might write should have this popular base of ratification. We might understand the way state constitutions reacted to each other on a spectrum. And we've spoken a lot what we'll call the relatively apolitical spectrum. State A learns from state B. So the classic example of learning is the earliest state constitutions are structured as follows. Provision one, provision two, provision three, provision dot, 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 until I think North Carolina you get to 105. Suddenly, I've forgotten who has the idea. You know, Article One, the legislature. Article Two, the executive. And that also affects the Constitution. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there was a party that said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is the best way of doing it versus Article One, Article Two. This really seems to be a political learning that, in fact, Breaking up the Constitution into parts is a really good idea. But it's important to understand that not all Americans thought that the experience of the Constitution showed that there were problems with human nature. For a great many people, say, the Madison's vices, no, the, Madison was the guy with the vices. <laughs> And it was the state legislatures who were actually trying to tax the large landowners. And so in fact, you know, we learn in school, the articles was a dismal failure, that America was on the brink of collapse. Well, there's a, there's a revisionist literature, and I don't know what to believe, and it's not my specialty. But a lot of people have gone back, and a lot of people said, no, that what is going on that is called learning is Losers in state constitutional fights are moving to create a national government that can help them win their state constitutional fights back home that not everything, every development is simply we learned better. But unsurprisingly, just as today, losers in state government, go to the national government, and losers in the national government say it really should be in the states. A lot of that is going on as state powers and federal powers are jockeying, not simply because people are nationalists or people are federalists or whatever, but because people think they can get more if they want in one domain rather than the other. Does anybody else on the panel want to respond uh, to Mark's comments about uh, political losers and winners and how that may play out in some of the decisions made at the convention, for example? Well, let me um, offer one response, which is that you, even though I have really touted the dark side of human nature, uh, I nonetheless want to put in a plug for the brighter side of human nature as well, that it wasn't just um, questions of who was on the winning or losing side, that often this particular individual policies that they were objecting to or trying to pursue were for many of them matters of principle. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the state provisions which were, was most hotly contested at this time were the paper money provisions. Uh, now, there were only a few states that had passed any form of paper money, and only two, I think, that were really problematic. Madison was from a state, Virginia, that had not yet passed any paper money provisions, although he feared that they were in danger of it. So he was not on the losing side. But nonetheless, he did think that one of the reasons for having a federal constitution 
was to protect against what he thought these hyperinflationary paper money provisions were doing because he thought that this was an unjust way of certain debtors trying to erase their debts either within their states or across state lines. And therefore, he thought that a federal constitution needed to uh, provide against that. And there were other members of the convention who thought the same way, that this was not just a matter of who was you know, the winner or the loser on this issue, but also they thought that this was a matter of principle. You, wanna, you look like you might have a, a response. <laughs> well, this is a small one, and that is there is to agree and but. <laughs> And the agreement is, yes, as a matter of principle. To fast forward, gigantically, one of the best books I've ever read is Kristen Luker's On the Politics of Abortion, which she actually pointed out it's a struggle between women. And women with careers tend to be pro-choice. Women who stay home tend to be pro-life. She said, so it's a matter of interest. But she said, but you know, it turns out what women think the role of women is depends on whether they have a career or not, so it's principle. And it's rather that in one sense, Madison did have a principle interest in no paper money. He was also aligned with the creditors of the world, even if not personally so. So they were both principles and interest, and you can't neatly in a way a lot of political scientists tried to do, say, here's the principle, here's the interest. We're all conglomerations. What we do depends on our principles, and what we do depends on our interests, and you can't tell them apart. So then let me ask this uh, follow-up question, which is, to what extent did frustrations with state legislatures uh, motivate some of the decision-making that happened in the convention? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it certainly did to a great extent. That is, so the state constitutions, these 15 and 12 states, uh, you know, gave them these models to draw on, and some of them were negative examples, as Lynn mentioned. Some of them were positive examples. So, I mean, it was pretty clear that there was going to be a check on the Congress in the, as they're de designing the Congress in, in 1787. A lot of discussion comes up about New York's Council of Revision in that way. Some people say, in fact, Madison was one of the ones, among others, they say, you know, maybe it's a good idea to have the executive and judicial um, body, members of the body come in here. Actually, it resurfaced on about three or four occasions during the convention in that way. Um, uh, and that, I wouldn't say it's so much dissatisfaction with how New York was working. It's just folks had some principled and other grounds. They say, no, let's actually just have it a pure executive veto in that sense. For one of the reasons, let's not have a mixture, perhaps an improper mixture of executive and judiciary, especially because the judiciary will have to pass judgment on these laws eventually. So let's let have the executive have a crack at the veto here, and then the judiciary will get a crack kind of later on. In fact, it's in that debate over a council uh, revision in the federal convention on New York style that folks are most explicit about saying, well, of course, the judiciary will have the opportunity to expound on these laws and presumably uh, uh, overturn them as necessary. And it's in the course of rejecting a New York council of revision and essentially doing exactly what Massachusetts had. The executive shall have a veto subject to a two thirds over ride by the Congress. So um, just one of the many cases in which, I mean, you read through um, the Federalist Papers, you read through the debates of 1787, state constitutions surface in a lot of ways. Now, those surface in different ways. Sometimes it's for the case, almost kind of lawyers, debater points is like, look, um, I've got my position here and I'm going to draw support from it because here's what's done someplace else. Or, well, you think this is radical to have this long of a term, or you think it's radical to have this large of a constituency, perhaps for the members of the House. Why, well, look what New York does. New York has some pretty large districts as well. A lot of the times that. But then sometimes it's actual learning. Let's actually see what's happening here. And sometimes those, those learning is good. And then sometimes it's learning of Rhode Island with its six-month turnover, potentially the legislature, and it's not good at all. And let's, let's try to avoid that as much as possible. Well, Julie's question, how much uh, of dissatisfaction with the state legislatures led to uh, the Constitutional Convention is a really difficult uh, question to answer because there was so much diversity. Now, during the Constitutional Convention, in response to William Patterson, who had said that the only reason we're here is really to strengthen defense and taxation and commerce, and that's pretty much it. That's the only purpose of the federal government. Madison replied, that he disagreed, he thought 
that the injustices they had experienced at the state level, more than anything, was responsible for calling this constitutional convention. Now, I think when Madison said that, it was true for Madison that for him, that was one of the, the greatest calls to revise the central government. But I don't think that that would be true overall throughout the convention. There was a great deal of variety of opinion, including some of uh, the defenders of their state constitutions who said that they looked to their state governments for all the happiness they expected in this world. I mean, I think that's pretty close to a direct quotation from Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut. And that the state legislatures were the protectors of their liberty and the uh, promoters of their happiness. So there was a great deal of variety within the Constitutional Convention as to just how dissatisfied they were with the state constitutions. Yeah, largely agree with Lynn, let me add what I think is a friendly amendment. You can tell me whether it's not. That is, there were some like Madison who, one, doesn't like most state legislatures, likes Massachusetts, but is scared stiff of Shay's rebellion that, gee, Massachusetts one day could become Vermont, not Vermont, Rhode Island. Heaven forbid anyone become Rhode Island. Where I think there is more uniform dissatisfaction with state constitutions is, unsurprisingly, state governments look to the interest of the people of the state, preferring the interest of the people of the state when the people of the state's interests clash with national interests. So I think there's more universal dissatisfaction is the system of state governance isn't getting us the subsidy we need to run the national government. I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction in the refusal of states to pay their debts to foreign countries is causing international problems that reverberate in other states that are paying their debts. So I think that I, there's a friendly amendment that the real universal dissatisfaction is not the Madisonian, what's going on inside the state that stays in the state, but what's going on inside the state that has severe externalities for other states and for the national government. And I, I accept your friendly amendment. <laughs> Uh, so uh, in the interest of uh, time and wanting to get uh, audience questions in, I'm going to ask one final question, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. Uh, so uh, we've talked a, a lot about how the revolutionary period state constitutions influence the drafting of the federal constitution. To what extent does the federal constitution influence the constitution making that happens after 1787? And John, I'll start with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, there's, there's often a view out there, I think, that, well, that, that what happened in the state constitution of 1776 to 77, there's a lot of interesting kind of things going on. Then we got to the real, real serious when we got the Federal Convention of 1787, and that, that became the model, and then, and then, and then folks drew on that. Um, to some extent, yes. I'm inclined, actually, um, not to see that as the as the general story. I I, I I take Lynn's third point of her opening remarks that state constitution served one purpose of governance, and the U.S. Constitution served a different purpose for a federal system. And so I'm struck by the fact that the discussion, experimentation, and learning that was going on in the states in drafting their state constitutions for the first decade basically continued, and the federal constitution got was another data point along with another 13, and eventually 16, and eventually kind of. 25 data points in the states, not I mean, maybe entitled to more than just one data point among many, because it was the federal constitution, but um, part of, uh, of a discussion. I guess the way I would put it is, um, is that whereas the federal constitution, in part because it's been made so difficult to amend, that there's been a bit of, um, of an absence of continued experimentation and innovation in institutional design and even in rights uh, uh, protection 
at the federal level because there's only been 27 amendments passed to that, and a full 10 of those were passed in the first two years. And so, whereas this, um, this, this, this discussion of institutional design and experimentation um, either doesn't take place at all at the federal level, or it doesn't take place through constitutional terms and gets put in kind of sub-constitutional terms, it continues at the state level. And so, 44 states decide, okay, we'll now um, get an executive veto, uh, but we'll not only do that, we'll have a line item veto as 44 states choose to do. That ex because, in part because state constitutions are subject to re regular change or accessible to change, they can have those institutional uh, discussions. I already mentioned that Pennsylvania had legislative term limits in 1776. Of course, to bring that full circle, 15 states currently have, st have term limits, and 14 of those states is in their state constitution as well. So on all kinds of, of dimensions then, um, we, 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 we we, the state constitutions continue to uh, uh, be sites of experimentation. Um, they look to the federal level, but they certainly don't feel constrained by what the federal level has done. And I, I, I'll, I'll add in a discussion on rights protection along with that. Just as um, there, uh, in terms of amendments to federal bill of rights, I mean, that's the federal bill of rights. If we're going to update that in some ways, it's going to be updated through judicial interpretation these days and not so much through, through official change. Well, there's been plenty of uh, willingness at the state level to update state bills of rights through the formal amendment process to, as, uh, as, as various folks have shown, to even add various rights to a clean environment. Uh, some types of nature of rights to um, economic and social security in various ways. Yes, it's not at the Federal Bill of Rights, but that's not the be all and end all of wisdom of American constitutionalism, which in many ways could be seen as in the state constitutional system alongside of, or in some ways, even a better embodiment of the continued discussion of constitutional thinking in the US. <laughs> Well, unlike John, I have so little experience of any of the constitutional conventions after 1787, but I have done some research into the Virginia Convention of 1829-1830, and it's an interesting one because this is really the last gathering of all of those original big name founders. John Marshall is there, James Madison, James Monroe, and they all have fairly small and significant roles to play there. And Madison's biggest role is to try to get the convention to agree to some kind of principled resolution to their main problem, which is how to apportion representation. And what he finds instead is that it is pure sausage making. It is nothing but trucking and bargaining. And, uh, and so as someone who is primarily a student of the debates of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, the debates of 1829, 1830 in Virginia are extremely demoralizing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, and I'd, I'd like to think, but only John can answer this question, that there are some other constitutional conventions that are, are more inspiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've already spoken about the main innovation, or the, the main thing of the US Constitution that sticks is pretty much every state constitution after 1789, 1791, Article I is the legislature, Article II is the executive, Article Three is the judiciary. I'm not sure there's any exception. There don't appear to be any exception in the first 50 years. Uh, now, this may be really trivial, uh, which demonstrates why I'm a professor, but it may be, and John, by the way, is absolutely right, there is remarkable innovation within the Article I's, within the Article II's, within the Article III's, but it may be just as when you react to someone you're working within their broader assumptions. In a lot of cases, you know, state constitutions say, well, we don't like this, we're going to change it to that. But consider some things. Our constitution doesn't mention political parties. OK, we have an excuse. What's Alabama's excuse in 1830 when there are political parties? It may be in some cases that things are in, things are out, even if different, because here is the framework. 
And it's rather interesting. I, I regard myself as the world's foremost expert on high school constitutions as the only person that has ever written an article on them. But that's the struggle. When, when the club, the Kiwanis Club, 16 blocks down, writes a constitution. Article 1, Article 2, Article 3. They may not have a legislative executive, but it's the pattern. What belongs in a constitution, what doesn't, may have been in some ways structured, though hardly defined, by the Constitution of 1787-1791. I, yeah, I just wondered, I mean, Lynn, Lynn said, are there any more inspiring kind of uh, of these uh, state constitutional episodes? Than so I didn't want to leave that, that hanging in that sense. And I, I believe there, there are. And I guess the first thing to be said is, um, you know, there have been over 230 state constitutional conventions held in the course of U.S. history. We've talked about some of these original ones from the 1776 to 1787 period. We've alluded at times to some of the others. Um, uh, so the first thing is there's, there's, there's all kinds of of, of stories to be told about each one of these particular conventions. Yes, we have one federal convention of 1787 at the federal level. We have 230 some of conventions at the state level. One of the more exciting things that's going on now is the number of groups that are beginning to get involved in actually kind of bringing some of these records to, to light, to make them accessible, to, to, to be using them in that way. And, and I, I'll just make one pitch. Some of the more interesting ones to me are the progressive era constitutional conventions meeting and the, um, the first two decades of the 1900s and are grappling with this new set of challenges. They, um, they actually believe that perhaps it's time to relash the, the legislative the representatives to the public more tightly than they had been. Perhaps he, and in some cases, by actually correct, creating direct democratic institutions. That's the origin of the initiative and referendum. And recall devices is, is in that, that era. Also dealing with the question of what's the relationship between uh, government and business, and particularly railroads, in, exact, in that sense. And so those, those are actually dealt with in that sense. And so, yes, there are inspiring things. And the one final thing I'll close with, just so we don't leave this out, is constitution making the state level takes place in a lot of ways through formal processes. Sometimes it's through legislation generated processes of the kind that that's how the 27 amendments of the U.S. Constitution come about. At times, they come about through constitutional convention-driven changes, but they also come about through citizen-initiated change in 18 states. And so there's all kinds of discussions and changes to legislative branches of state constitutions going on right now today through citizen-initiated processes. Um, most notably, we're a few weeks out, I guess now, from uh, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in the partisan and gerrymandering case, and what was most notable among the many notable things about that decision was in saying the federal courts are no longer going to be a, a forum for these cases. The majority opinions pointed directly to, and there has been a good amount of state constitutional activity on the redistricting process, whether in setting different rules, as in Florida, or setting up different processes, as in a number of states. Many of those have come about through citizen initiative processes. I'll close there just with a, with a way of the, the continuing attention to state constitutions and the continuing re reconfiguration of legislatures in, in state constitutions. Thank you. Um, I believe there is a mic for audience Q&A. Yep. I, so uh, this gentleman is going to bring the mic over for audience Q&A, and I'm going to go with this gentleman right here to ask the first question. So uh, between the articles and the Constitution, the federal constitution, uh, there was a pretty big power grab, really, of the federal government between the two from states. Could you just comment on what uh, what was the idea of like preemption at that time, and whether uh, state constitutions before 1789 contemplated it versus how state constitutions after that contemplated it? Could you explain uh, preemption and contemplate so, fe uh, so federal federal preemption. So when the federal government comes in and says um, that the roads should be built a certain way, uh, that means that the states don't really have the authority any longer to comment on how roads should be built. 
I'll just mention one thing on that. One of the things that I alluded to this is you actually look at the legislative power clauses in each of the state constitutions. And I read from Georgia's where they basically said, look, you can do anything that's not um, repugnant to this constitution. But in at least one other, and it's escaping me right now, at least one other constitution, they say, well, you, you, you have plenary power unless it's forbidden by this constitution or unless it's forbidden by the Congress in that way. So there was not, they were aware of and certainly realized they were actors in a confederal system, one might say at that time. Clearly, things changed um, significantly by the time we get the U.S. Constitution adopted. But I, I wouldn't, um, I, I, there was an awareness of we are not, um, we are not supreme. We are, are, are part of a system in which we, um, we have to operate in that way. It would change a, a big, good deal by 1789. Two points, uh, one of which is tangential, but should be said uh, in lieu of introductions. In case all of you haven't worked out, there is nobody in the world who knows more about state constitutions and state constitutional development than John Dine. And for those of you who are studying, this is the first place you start. Um, power grant. The question is, and I have a, a view of this, which is a bit of a lefty, lefty history, but I will say that my lefty history is contestable as righty history is. Here's what's a little clearer. That is, what's interesting about the early state constitutions is almost none of them outside of South Carolina had foreign policy powers. Uh, North Carolina, how does North Carolina declare war? We've got no clue. How does, does North Carolina have an ambassador? No clue. It's not that they deny it, it's just not there. So on one version, all that's going on is the national government is getting a structure that enables it to exercise the powers it was supposed to exercise. And states weren't supposed to interfere when the national government had a treaty with France. Now, there are more contested questions, which those of us on different political things can argue about whether, in fact, the national constitution was taking powers to the states, how broad those powers were intended to be. But a significant amount of the powers weren't a power grab from the states, but were rather an attempt to fill a power vacuum at the national level. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, second that and expand on that. that um, Friendly amendment? <laughs> fr friendly amendment and elaboration. That, um, that it all comes down to this question of sovereignty, which a lot of people said that the Articles had given absolute sovereignty to the states. And what we needed, and uh, people like Wils James Wilson, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison said, what we need is to shift sovereignty um, unambiguously into the federal government. But then when they worked it out in debate, it turned out it was a lot more complicated than that. Partly for the reason that you already mentioned, the states didn't have power over foreign policy. That was placed in the federal government. And there was even a kind of supremacy clause in the Articles of Confe Confederation insofar as the states would inviolably observe any kind of constitutional law passed under the Confederation Congress. Now, of course, they didn't, but they were bound inviolably by a, 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 a promise that they would so do. And that's why the supremacy clause in uh, the United States Constitution is not nearly so significant as a, as a lot of people think it was. It was originally proposed by the New Jersey plan, uh, which was the confederal plan. And then when uh, the nationalists, the centralized, lost their key uh, point in how to leverage power over the states, the federal veto, Luther Martin, the most anti-federalist states' rights delegate there, said, but have a supremacy clause. Uh, we'll throw that to you as a sop. So the idea of who was going to be supreme was something that was very fluid. And Madison at one point said, you know, the states never did have complete sovereignty. Sovereignty is something that's on a sort of continuum. And even under the Articles, it's a little bit ambiguous. And even though there were some members who wanted un unambiguously to shift it to the federal government, they recognized by the end of the convention that the Constitution simply did not do that. And according to Hamilton in the New York Convention, 
what they did is they divided sovereignty, what had hitherto been believed uh, impossible, but they had done it because each government was sovereign over its particular sphere. And therefore, if you uh, focus sovereignty on different spheres, then they would not clash. And of course, that is a very pat answer, but, uh, but there at least is this theory that both governments were going to be sovereign, and what they had done was only allow the federal government to, as you were saying, uh, exercise the power which they had always had, as well as add uh, some additional powers. I think there was a, a question all the way back here, a uh, gentleman with the goatee. Yep. You. Is it like more of a beard? Yeah. <laughs> it's a shat you shadow. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was wondering about state level precedents for Marbury versus Madison. Uh, we have what I've always suspected is a myth that uh, the Supreme Court overruling legislation was completely invented by Chief Justice Marshall uh, the same way Napoleon in that same year you know, placed an imperial crown on his own head. And I was very interested then to hear Professor Denon say that you know, people already were saying that that would happen. And I was wondering, had it happened at the state level in the past, and and what were what was the what were the ideas about it before Marbury versus Madison happened? Okay, um, yeah. It turns out there is to say judicial review was flourishing before 1803 um, would be an exaggeration. But if you were to get a law school question in the class of 1799 on can courts overturn statutes of a coordinate legislature, you would certainly have to know that Virginia's done it. South Carolina has done it. New Hampshire has done it. Rhode Island has done it. New Jersey has done it. New York may have done it. And it was controversial. So if you had said, and it's clear in 1799 that we've anticipated Chief Justice Roberts where we you know, strike down a whole lot of things, uh, that would be a wrong answer. It was a practice. It was a contested practice. And no court had really declared unconstitutional the big legislative proposal of the government. So it tended to be on somewhat side issues. But um, Marbury is there, and most of the framers assumed something like judicial review would happen. They assume something like judicial review of the South Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina form. What they would think about modern practice is as unanswerable as to what they would think about the Metro service. <laughs> Yeah, if, if you look at the debates in the convention, that does seem to bear out that there was an assumption that something like judicial review would take place. And in fact, that was one of the arguments against the Council of Revision of combining members of the Supreme Court with the president in having an exercise of a veto power over legislation. Many people argued, well, that would give the courts a double veto because they have the veto power later on to review legislation and to, and to declare it null and void. Now, when that argument was used, most people did not deny it, but one person did. John Dickinson said, well, that, that would put a dangerous power in, in the courts. And so it was not universally accepted, but there seemed to be a broad assumption. And then one of the most interesting things I find about the correspondence between Madison and Jefferson on the question as to whether or not they should include a Bill of Rights in the Constitution, and Jefferson is saying it's absolutely important, and Madison is saying, well, you know, it may be a good thing sometimes, but it's not very important. Madison lists what he thinks are the four reasons why it's not that important, uh, and two reasons why a Bill of Rights is a good idea. And none of them include the operations of the court. And it's left to Jefferson to write back to him and said, you know, 
I agree with everything you said as to the positive reasons, but there's one other reason, and that is the power it gives in the hands of the courts, with wi which wisely administered, would strike down any laws that contradicted a Bill of Rights. And Madison ended up using that argument when he proposed amendments to the Constitution in the first Congress. But I still find it fascinating that that's not where his mind went to when he was weighing the pros and cons of a Bill of Rights. Uh, the gentleman in the white shirt right over here. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to uh, participate in this panel today. Um, so my question is about the relevancy of uh, actually reviewing or using uh, what people said at conventions or at the ratification uh, debates uh, to interpret the Constitution, uh, because in the Federalist Papers, neither Hamilton nor Madison uh, called upon the fact that they were at the convention. Uh, they didn't say, this is what we said at the convention, this is who this, said at, this person said at the convention. Um, because it's possibly because they didn't find it authoritative uh, that it was, you know, it, we would rest on the, the strength of our arguments about the words of the Constitution because the normative value of the words of the Constitution derived from the fact that they settled these debates and that we decided at, you know, at the end of the debate, these are the words we can agree on, that's why they're important words because there's where we, we met in the middle. Um, so I know this is what you guys do, and I don't mean to like say this is not relevant, but just if you know the place that it, it would it would uh, it would play. Well, um, I mean, this this happens to be something that I'm working on right now. I'm I'm studying the first publication of the journal records, which don't get published and actually don't get distributed to members of Congress until 1819, right in the thick of the debates over the Missouri Compromise. And, um, and so one of the things to recognize is that nobody had access to any records whatsoever about what happened in the secret proceedings of the federal convention until this was published. And then it was just a list of motions and, uh, and votes. They still didn't have access to the debates. Um, but nonetheless, as soon as the journal records were published, all of a sudden, all talk was about the wise framers, the immortal framers, the wisdom of the framers. And people were trying to read in between the lines of the votes and the way that the, that the uh, proposals uh, were formulated in order to discern what was on the mind of the framers when these were passed. But this was um, somewhat a new development because uh, when it was first tried in the House, it was tried by Madison, who later described it as a slight reference to what took place in the convention, and he got pounced on by Hamilton, by Edmund Randolph, and by three members of the House who said that evidence from the secret proceedings of the federal convention were inadmissible for determining the meaning of the convention. But Madison went on to talk about the arguments in the state convention, and throughout his life, he always said that the arguments from the state conventions were somehow uh, the only legitimate key outside of the text of the Constitution itself for determining its meaning, because that is how you determine the, uh, the meaning of the parties to the contract. What am I doing? And I, I mean this not as a joke, though if you laugh, I won't mind. Um, am I writing as an historian? If I'm writing as an historian, yeah, of course. What the people thought they were doing matters to, you know, what the document, how the document was understood. If I'm arguing before the Supreme Court, well, I got the four liberals in my pocket, or if I, do, if I lose them, the ball game is over. As far as I'm concerned, is there any framer that will appeal to one of the five people on the other side? And that's what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything related to history. So in one sense, you know, if it's simply persuading a court, um, what does the document mean I know a lot of people take that question very seriously as my sort of offhand reference to how I do it pragmatically suggests. I think the document means what we think it best means. Now, this is not to say we can make it mean anything. I can't make the uh, box score of a baseball game you know, mean liberty and freedom for everyone. But I think 
there are lots of different strands. As we've said, you know, the framers were divided. It was a process. There was not a snapshot moment where everyone agreed. And what different factions do is they choose different framers at different times. And I'm no different than anybody else. Do you want to take on the virtues of uh, originalism, or maybe we could take the last question? <laughs> we'll take the last question in the interest of time. OK, who wants to the last question? Gentleman right behind uh, the gentleman who just asked the question before. Go ahead. Um, so I was really interested in those uh, Council of Censors, and just curious, as, as the framers of, of the US Constitution were, were putting together Article 5, and I'm not really recalling what kind of debates there were around around that. Um, were were they mindful of these experiences of the of the state constitutions, which were much much more easily amended? Were, were they were they consciously reacting against that in setting such a high barrier, or was it just something that? They sort of didn't think too hard. I mean, when we say that, I mean, so Article Five, the amendment process. What were they thinking of? Of course, um, we look at it today as a as a difficult to access process. It takes two thirds of members of Congress or two thirds of the states to propose an amendment. Then takes three fourths of the states to ratify either state legislatures to ratify or state conventions. All of the con uh, constitutional amendments have but one have taken the first of those routes that is being ratified by state legislatures. The only one that was ratified by the alternative procedure was the repeal of prohibition, which Congress gets to choose when it's putting forward how it's gonna be ratified. And they said, actually, we're gonna have this ratified by uh, conventions held in the states, not by legislature. So we look back at that now today and say, well, it's a rigid process. It's not clear that in 1787 that the founders would have seen themselves as creating a very, very rigid process in part because they would have had in, in mind the model of some state constitution, but they also have the model of the Articles of Confederation in that way. And so from one perspective, they were creating a slightly more accessible process than was in place in that way. And so you see various Federalist papers here. The one that we oftentimes go to is Federalist 49, in which Madison is specifically responding to a Jeffersonian claim that perhaps every generation should have a chance to, to kind of revise this. this and, 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 and Madison's pushing back against that. But there's other Federalist papers where the discussion say, well, we want to have a proper mix of, in some ways, uh, uh, a stability here, and in some ways, an opportunity to kind of updating here in that sense. So I, we, my, my only point here is we look at it as, oh, they're consciously creating a very rigid process. Um, maybe that's not exactly how they, they it, it, their, their, um, their uh, understanding of what they were doing is probably at odds with, with what we take that process that they've created to have done. This will please my panelists immensely, but I think I'm one of the few professors of con law. The first United States document we read is the Pennsylvania Constitution in my class. And I teach it because I said, you know, think of who you are. And for everyone, I said, think of who you are not. And who you are not is just as important to your identity as who you are. And what the Constitution is, is not the Constitution of Pennsylvania, that the framers, in fact, were very aware of it and were self-consciously reacting against it. Indeed, there's a coup d'etat that will take place a couple of years later in Pennsylvania to substitute a more US Constitution-friendly Constitution. The Pennsylvania Constitution, the theory is you want to get, and with the Council of Censors, it's designed the unmodified voice of the people. The idea is that any time you try to modify the voice of the people, you get elitism like Madison, who acts only out of the interest of the creditor class. For the United States Constitution, the idea is we want a filtration because we have these self-interested people, and the only way we can get an elite that does not act for the creditor class, but acts for the common good, is by, in fact, developing schemes. So that while we have a popular sovereignty base, decisions are made by people particularly good at governing and not simply being representative enough to pay the subsidy. 
Okay, I think with that, uh, I would like everyone to join me in thanking our panelists for a really lively discussion. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it back over to, to Nate. Yes, thank you very much to our distinguished panel and our, our moderator. Thank you all for coming. We will have part two of uh, this series on states as the laboratories of democracy in September. So look forward to, to that event. Um, you can find information about that and all the things that Article One Initiative does at our website, articleiinitiative.org. Thank you very much. Thank you.